7, guys. So being, uh, for those that are first-time visitors, what we do is we go through the Bible chapter by chapter on Sunday mornings. So uh, we're up to Luke chapter 7, and we try to go through the whole chapter as much as we possibly can. So Luke chapter 7, if you look at verse number 9, Luke chapter 7, verse 9, the Bible reads, When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. The title of the sermon this morning is So Great Faith. You know, Jesus Christ was surprised. He was amazed to see so great faith. And I hope that we can work toward being those kind of people that Jesus Christ can look down on us and say, hey, look at that great faith. Look at New Life Baptist Church. Look at that so great faith that I see on the Sunshine Coast. So if we start with verse number one, Luke chapter seven, verse one, the Bible says, now, when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. And a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. So here we have, yes, Jesus Christ. And we, I've been mentioning this in some of the previous chapters. We have Jesus Christ, yes, primarily focusing his ministry on the Israelites, primarily on the Jews. But here we have a Roman centurion, a Gentile. You know, the, the, the Jews would see him as a heathen even, right? He's a centurion. What does centurion mean? Does anyone know? It's kind of like how we use, have the word century, century, right? When we talk about a century, we're talking about a hundred years, aren't we? So a centurion was a man who had about a hundred people under his authority. Okay, he was a Roman soldier with about a hundred people under his command. We get to verse number three. And look at this. When he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. So verse number three tells us a lot about this Roman centurion. Tells us a lot that he heard of Jesus and he calls unto Jesus Christ. Do you think his faith was in the right place? Absolutely. Right? We see that this man was already a man who was already uh, sort of uh, aware of the, God of the God of Israel, even though he was a Roman. And then he says, He sent unto him the elders of the Jews. So even the Jews, the elders, those that were respected, those that were honored, heard his command. You know, so this was a man with a good reputation, even amongst the elders of the land, even as a non-Jewish man. And then we see that he beseeches Christ, he's calling upon Christ that he would come and heal his servant. So we see the heart of the man there as well, that he cares for his servants. You know, yes, he's a man of authority. Yes, he's a man of power. But you can see that pride has not gone to his head. He loves his servant so much that he would call on Jesus Christ to come and heal him. So all around we see the centurion, as far as the goodness of man is concerned, he's a pretty decent guy. He's a pretty good guy. He's well respected, he's well liked. Verse number four. And when they came to Jesus, these are the elders of the Jews, when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly saying that he, the Roman centurion, he was worthy for him, uh, he should do this. And then look, look what they say about him. For he loveth our nation, and he have built us a synagogue. So there we have it. Now we know why this man trusts in Jesus Christ. Now we know why he knows that Jesus Christ can come and heal his servant. Because he loves the nation of Israel. He loves their nation. Now I don't want you guys to confuse the nation of Israel in the time of Jesus Christ with the nation of Israel today. All right? We can't confuse these two things. We need to transport ourselves back to this time Right, there was still the temple worship. You know, by and large, we had the ministry of John the Baptist beforehand, prepare, preparing a generation for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right, and the God of the nation of Israel was, of course, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the true God of the Bible. All right, and so when we see that this man loved the nation, what did he love about the nation? Did he love the sin of the nation? Was that what he was what, what, what he was enjoying? Was it the, uh, you know, the, the tourists, the tourist, the places that he can go and visit? Was it the scenery that he loved about the nation? No, we see there that he had built us a synagogue. What did he love about the nation? What was the synagogue used for? It was used on the Sabbath day for people to go into, the, into that place and hear the reading of God's word and the preaching of God's word. So we see what he loves about the nation of Israel. He loves the scriptures. He loves hearing the word of God. That's what he loves about Israel, okay? 
Now, we need to understand this because there are those that say, well, we have to. And this is so unusual in Christianity today. We have people that say, you have to love the nation of Israel today, the modern day nation of Israel today. Now, let me say a couple of things here. I love every ethnicity, every race equally, okay? Equally. Everybody without the Lord Jesus Christ is going to eternity in hell. And we ought to love everybody so much for it to, for it to drive us as a church to go out there, knock doors, and preach the gospel, all right? And if there are brethren in other nations and they're doing the same job, praise God, we ought to be praying for them and blessing them and encouraging them, all right? So please don't misunderstand. But do you think the centurion today, the centurion that we're reading about, could love the nation of Israel today? Do you think loving Israel today as a, as a man and building them synagogues today would lead him to believe on Jesus Christ? The way he called on Jesus Christ to come and heal his servant? I'm talking about today. Absolutely not. All right? Today, unfortunately, the nation of Israel have turned away from the scriptures. All right? They do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, they hate him. They reject the Lord Jesus Christ. So do you see the centurion today going and building a synagogue for the false religion of Judaism? Of course not. All right? Now, if the nation had received Christ, I could see him today, yeah, building a synagogue or building a building where they can meet for church or what have you. All right? But we need to understand, guys, what we see in the Bible, we can't necessarily um, associate with today. Because Israel today, the Jews as a whole, have rejected Christ. They hate Christ. They blaspheme his name. And they believe their works. They believe their good works. They believe their uh, descendancy will get them saved. And that is not true. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come in front of the Father except by me. Okay? So we need to understand this, guys, as we read through the scriptures. Uh, you know, the times of, of Jesus' time were very different to the times that we see today in that land. All right? Now, another thing that I want you guys to realize, and, I, and I, I've been thinking about this and I've been saying this to you guys a few times, a lot of people ask the questions. You know, obviously there were people saved in the Old Testament. Okay? Obviously there were people saved, and in the Old Testament days, it was the same way. It was salvation by grace through faith. Their faith was on God, the God of the Bible. Okay? And we see that in, in the Old Testament days, a lot of what they did was, was picturing Christ. You know, the sacrifices, the daily sacrifices of the animals, you know, was ultimately picturing the ultimate sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? And, and the priests in their garments in, uh, being washed represented the righteousness of Christ and, and, and Jesus Christ being our, our great high priest in the New Testament. But remember, the New Testament days did not begin until the death of the testator, until Jesus Christ was crucified and rose again from the dead. That's when the New Testament days started. But of course, people were saved in the Old Testament. Okay? So the question comes, those that were saved in the Old Testament, did they have to believe on Jesus to maintain their salvation? Or, you know, could they lose their salvation or anything like that? I mean, what are your thoughts? We'll see soon, right? I'll show you something, a couple of examples here, but this is what I believe. And I think this is what we see in the scriptures as you read through it. Is those that were saved under the Old Testament, as soon as they heard of Jesus, as soon as they knew the Messiah was here, as soon as they recognized him as the Son of God, it was immediately, yep, that's the man. That's the one we've been waiting for. That's the Messiah. That's the Son of God. And they would follow him and listen to his preaching. Okay? So it wasn't so much that they had to uh, believe on Jesus Christ to be saved because they were already saved, but because they were saved, they immediately recognized the Messiah to come and they followed after him. Okay? And this is what I, I believe we see here. We see in this centurion man, a man who was already loving the scriptures, a man that I believe was already saved because Jesus Christ talks about his faith. And then when he hears of Jesus Christ, he goes, yep, that's the man. That's the guy that I need here to come and, uh, and heal my servant. Now, just to give you an, another example of this, a little bit more clearer, keep your finger there and turn to Acts 18. Keep your finger there, turn to the book of Acts, Acts 18. And I've already preached about this guy before, but I think it's relevant now. Um, it's about Apollos, Apollos, in, uh, in Acts 18, verse 24. Acts 18, verse 24. 
We're going to read this slowly and understand what's going on here. Acts 18 verse 24. Acts 18 verse 24. The Bible says, And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. Now let's just stop there. If this man Apollos is mighty in the scriptures, do you think he's saved? Absolutely, right? Because the scriptures are spiritually discerned. You can only understand the scriptures if you're saved. If you have the Holy Ghost in you and living in you, all right? So we see if this man's mighty in the scriptures, he is already saved, okay? Now look at verse 25. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the Spirit. Was he saved? Yes, all right? Fervent in the Spirit. He spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. But look at this. Knowing only the baptism of John. So his knowledge of the scriptures only got up to the baptism of John. Right? And what did John preach about? You know, to, he preached about the one that would come after him, right? The Lord Jesus Christ. To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But all he knew of at this point was the baptism of John. So obviously he heard some preaching. I assume he was baptized in the baptism of John as well. But that's all he knew. Okay? Verse 26. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took unto, sorry, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. So Aquila and Priscilla, these people know of Christ. They've heard the preaching of Paul as well. They take him, they take Apollos and they expound unto him the way of God. They expound to him the scriptures more perfectly. Okay. More fully. There were things that he was missing. He only got up to the baptism of John. All right? Now look at this, verse 27. And when he, Apollos, was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them uh, much which had believed through grace. Now look at this. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. So what was he missing before? He was missing the whole point of Jesus Christ. He knew Jesus was coming. He knew the Messiah was coming. He knew he had to follow and put his faith on him. But he only knew up to the baptism of John. He wasn't aware of every, of the, the three years of ministry of Christ. He probably wasn't aware of everything that had happened. But he was still preaching the scriptures powerfully. Okay? So this was a man who was saved already, but he wasn't aware of everything that had gone past with Jesus Christ. I don't know where he was. You know, if he was from Alexandria, maybe he was in other places. Maybe he was a traveler a bit, okay? But then you see Aquila and Priscilla, they take him aside and say, by the way, this is what you're missing. The Messiah has come and his name is Jesus. And he's like, all right, yeah, absolutely. And then he continues preaching on Jesus Christ as the Messiah. So we see that. We see those that were saved under the Old Testament, when they hear or see the, the works of Jesus Christ, then they would believe on him and follow him. But they're already saved. It's just a natural consequence during this transitional period between the Old Testament to the New Testament. So I thought that was something interesting for us to know. If you can go back to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7 verse 6. Luke chapter 7 verse 6. So we have the centurion man calling on Christ. Verse 6. Then Jesus went with them. And when he now... So, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. This man was a man of humility. We see this in the centurion man, right? A powerful man with authority. Okay? And yet, when he comes to faith, he recognizes who Jesus is. He goes, look, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to have the Messiah under my roof. Okay? Verse 7. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. I'm not even worthy to come to you, Jesus. But say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. Wow. That is great faith. Jesus, you don't even need to be here. You just say it. You just will it. And I know my servant will be healed. Right? Verse number eight. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, go, and he goeth, and another come, and he cometh. And to my servant do this, and, and he doeth it. 
So he says, look, I know what authority is. I know if I say things, things will happen. And he says, of Jesus, I know if you just say things, it'll happen because I know who you are, right? Verse number nine, when Jesus heard these things and loved these words, he marveled at him. Every time I see Jesus Christ marveling, I marvel because Jesus Christ is God in the, you know, in the flesh. He's the son of God and he's perfect and he knows all things. And even then, he can still be marveled, right? He can still marvel at some of the things that we accomplish and do for him, right? He marveled at him and turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. This was a faithful man, a Gentile. And I believe this would picture ultimately what would happen in the times of Israel. Yes, did Israel have some faith? Absolutely. There were still many that believed on him, many that followed after Christ. But by and large, it would be the Gentiles that would receive Christ. Okay, By and large, as a, as a nation of Israel as a whole, they would choose to reject him. But Jesus Christ, to the Gentiles, would be received. And this was prophesied, guys. And I just, you, want to, you don't need to turn there. I'll just read it to you. Isaiah 49, verse 6. It says, And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. So this was prophesied of Jesus Christ already, that he would also be a light to the Gentiles and that the Gentiles would follow after Christ. And I believe this is just a, a, a picture of the spiritual state of Israel. They were lacking in faith, but yet the Gentile, the Gentile man, who was fresh to the scriptures, built the synagogue, great faith. He was someone that was ready to just believe on Christ. Verse number 10, Luke 7, 10. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. So absolutely, you know, the servant there is healed. So we see the power of prayer there. You know, that we, 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 when we pray, when we bring our requests before the Lord, even in sickness, you know, we ought to have this great faith as a centurion, knowing that all God has to do is say it and, and we can be healed. Our prayers can be answered. Verse number 11. And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him, and much people. And when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. So we see Jesus Christ turns up at this uh, funeral, okay? And it's, it's uh, the mother, she lost her only son, he's dead, and she's a widow. What does that tell you about her? She's got no one else. She doesn't have a husband to provide for her. She hasn't got any children that will look after her now. So what do we see in verse 13? And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. Wow, the, the great compassion of Christ, that he would come and see this funeral, see this woman who was lonely, uh, you know, who would provide for her? And yet we see Christ filled with compassion, filled with compassion. And again, guys, we need to understand as a church, as individual people, you know, again, we don't have the power to raise the dead like Jesus Christ did, okay? But we do have the power to take the words of God, the gospel, and preach it and see people saved. Okay, we do have the power in a sense to raise the dead, not because we have the power, but because of the words of God, because of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, we do it week in, week out. I understand that. You know, we're probably going to do it for the rest of our lives. And sometimes there's going to come a point in your life where you're just going through the motions. You're just doing it because that's what we always do. Okay, but I don't want you to lose your compassion. It's what Jesus Christ had. If you say, I don't have the compassion, then get some compassion. All right, because these people need more than a son being raised from the dead. They need their souls saved from hell. They need to hear the good news of the gospel. We need to feel something when we go out there. We need to maybe shed a tear because we see these souls saved without Jesus Christ. Now, how many people out there believe they're going to heaven and yet they're still trusting in their works? They're still trusting in their own righteousness and they've not put all their faith on Jesus Christ alone. That should bring us to tears. That should bring some compassion into us, all right? Verse number, what am I up to? 14. 
fifth, uh, 13, sorry. Verse number th- uh, 13. And when, he, when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the beer. By the way, that's just a, it's not a coffin, it's a, it's like a wooden uh, stretcher sort of thing. So you could see the dead body there. And they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. And he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all. And they glorified God, saying, There is a great prophet. Uh, sorry, that a great prophet is risen up among us. And that God hath visited his people. How true are those words, by the way? That God hath visited his people. Now, I don't know if these people know what they're really saying. All right? But they are saying that God has visited his people. What does that make Jesus Christ? It makes him God. Right? He's God the Son. He's God in the flesh. And this reminds me of Psalm 8. You, don't need, you can turn there if you want. Psalm 8. We, we already preach for Psalms. But the Bible says there in Psalm 8 verse 3. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, thou hast crowned him with glory and honor. And we know the secondary application to this is to Jesus Christ, that God would visit man. And this is essentially what they're saying. When they see these great miracles, the great works of God, they realize, man, God is visiting us. Whether they realize Jesus Christ himself is that God, or just that he's doing the works for the power of God, it doesn't really matter. But, you know, people are starting to wake up to the fact, wow, this is a great prophet. You know, they can even raise the dead. Right? We've seen him, we've seen him heal the sick. We've, seen, we've heard the great fame of him. But here he is, this guy being on his way to his burial, and he can raise him from the dead and it was compassion it was compassion that drove jesus christ to do that all right and as i said we need a bit of compassion i think sometimes we can get a bit hardened you know it's just another door you know it's just another week of soul winning and we need to turn you know change that about ourselves if that's how we feel okay verse 17 luke 6 7 verse 17 and this rumor of him uh went forth throughout all judea and throughout all the region round about so all the news, rumors of Jesus Christ going throughout all of Judea <coughs> for the great works that he's done. And the disciples of John showed him of all these things. So this is speaking of John the Baptist. The disciples of John the Baptist have heard of all the great things that Jesus is doing. So they take it to John. And if you remember, I'll, I'll read to you from Matthew. Maybe keep your finger there. Turn to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. Because this is a time when John the Baptist was actually in prison. He was not a free man. You remember he he preached um, and he was uh, then arrested and put in prison. Go to Matthew 11 verse 2. Matthew 11 verse 2. We'll go back to Luke 7 in a minute. But Matthew 11 verse 2. It says, Now when John, that's John the Baptist, had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Okay, so that's Matthew 11, verse 2 and 3. Go back to Luke 7. Go back to Luke 7, verse 19. Luke 7, verse 19. It says here, And John calling unto him, two of his disciples sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? I mean, these are strange words of John the Baptist. Right? Strange words. Because... If anybody knew who Jesus Christ was, it was John the Baptist. It was John the Baptist that baptized the Lord Jesus Christ. It was John the Baptist that heard the voice from heaven, from God the Father saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. It was John the Baptist that saw the Holy Spirit descend like a bodily, like a dove upon Jesus Christ. Right? So he saw these amazing things. And it's John the Baptist that pointed to Christ and said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. It was him, the same guy. you know. And as we'll soon see, Jesus Christ calls him the greatest, the greatest prophet, the greatest man. And yet, what do we see with the greatest man, this great man that pointed people to Christ? We see doubt in him, right? We see doubt arise. And you say, why is that? It's because he's gone through persecution. He's been arrested. He's in prison. 
He's not having a great time. He's having a hard time. And all he's done, his whole life, was dedicated to being that uh, faithful servant that would bring forth and, and uh, prepare the way of the Lord. All right? My point is, guys, is that uh, if you go through times of doubt, you know, is this really the word of God? Is, am I really saved? Is, you know, has Jesus done it all? You know, I want you to just think about John the Baptist for a minute, okay? Doubt is okay. It's okay to have some doubts. You know, I, I would expect probably someone that's been saved recently, someone that's a new convert, will probably have a few more doubts than someone that's been in the faith for a while. I'll say to you right now, I'm at a point now, I just have no doubts whatsoever. I mean, if there's anything in this Bible that I question, like, I'm like, what's, what's that about? It's like, oh, it's me. I can't work it out. It's not that the Bible's wrong. It's not that I'm doubting the Word of God. It's just that I need more wisdom, all right? But that comes with time, okay? But I just want to encourage you, if you are someone that has gone through doubts in the faith, you know, it's not completely unnatural, okay? It's common, it's normal. We see even John the Baptist, okay? But how, do, how does Jesus Christ respond to John the Baptist there? Look at verse 20. Luke seven twenty. When the men were come unto him, they said, John Baptist have sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? Now, this is how Jesus responds. He doesn't respond to that question immediately. Look what he does. Verse 21. And in that same hour, he cured many of their infirmities and plagues, and of evil spirits. And unto many that were blind, he gave sight. Then he answers. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, and how the blind see, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. So go back to John and talk to him about the great works that I've done in the lives of all these people that you've seen. That will convince him for two reasons. Uh, two reasons, right? Number one, obviously the great works. But the second reason, obviously we know that they had the book of Isaiah back then in that, day, that time. All right, This is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. What he's speaking about is found in Isaiah 29 verse 18. I'll just read it. Isaiah 29 verse 18, which says, And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of the uh, obscurity and out of darkness. The meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. What Jesus Christ was doing was a fulfillment of Scripture. Hey, what's going to get you uh, out of your doubts and, and, and assured is fulfillment of Scripture, knowing the Word of God, trusting the Word of God. Jesus Christ says, I'm saved eternally, I can never lose it then you rest on that promise. And once you can rest on the words of God, once you can rest on scriptures, then those doubts will start going away. You'll start believing the promise that God gave you, that he would eternally save you through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ by faith on him. Okay? And we see this, that Jesus Christ is essentially saying, he is the Holy One of Israel. He is the one that was prophesied to do these amazing miracles. And this basically, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, confirms who John the Baptist was. That he would be that one coming in the spirit of Elijah, preparing the way of the Lord. And then we see Jesus Christ, he, he, he now confirms about John the Baptist. Verse 24, Luke 7, 24. And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. What went ye into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken in the wind? So he says, like, why did you go into the wilderness? Was it to see uh, a wheat being shaken in the wind? Did you go and see a weak preacher? Did you go see a weak prophet that gets tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine? Is that what you went to see? Someone that gets shaken? And, no, by the wind, no. Okay. What was their purpose to go out into the wilderness? Verse 25. For what went ye out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Did you go to, to look for a man that's, you know, dressed very uh, pretty, you know, very soft in, in his expensive clothing in the wilderness? Is that what you expect to find in the wilderness? Someone that's dressed in rich 
nice clothing? No. Behold, they that are gorgeously apparelled and live uh, delicately are in the king's courts. That's not where you, why you went to the wilderness. They're in the king's courts. Verse 26. But what went ye out to see? A prophet. Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. So what do we learn about John the Baptist? A man who's living in the wilderness. A man that didn't have soft apparel. We know that he had a leather a belt, a girdle around his, uh, his loins. We know that he was dressed in, in camel's hair. We know that he was a rough man living in the wilderness, living off milk, uh, sorry, of, of honey and, and, and locusts. I mean, the guy ate insects, right? right to, and, and yet people came looking for him, all right? They weren't looking for the soft preacher. And let me tell you guys, we don't want soft preaching, all right? Now, sometimes I have to, you know, preach of it forcefully. Sometimes I have to push myself because I don't want to be that reed shaking in the wind either. You know, if we raise preachers in this church, I don't want you guys to be that reed shaking in the wind, right? You know doctrine, you stand on the word of God, and I don't want anyone here being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. That's not what we're coming to see, all right? I want this to be wilderness Baptist church, not King's Court Baptist Church. Hey, King's Court is a time in the millennium when we rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years, but then I know it's perfect because Christ is in charge, right? He's made us kings and priests, and that time is to come, right? But right now, we need a bit of rough preaching. We need a bit of camel's hair, all right, instead of nice silk clothing. You know, the preaching that comes from the Word of God, whether good or bad, we need to hear it all. And we see that people came flocking into the wilderness to see that rough man, to see that hard preacher, the one that would stand true on the word of God. So we see Jesus Christ, yeah, John the Baptist had some doubts. And in case anybody else was doubting about John the Baptist, Jesus Christ says, no, this man is much more than a prophet. He's a great man. Verse 20, what are we up to? Actually, let me read to you quickly from 1 Corinthians 2.4. Very quickly, speaking of Paul, what kind of preacher was Paul? Paul the Apostle, right? It says, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. I don't come here trying to impress you with man's wisdom, says Paul, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That's what people want when they come and hear a preacher. They want a man filled with the Holy Spirit and with power. Okay? You might say, I'm not good with my words. I'm not eloquent. You know, I trip over as I read or I mess it up. It's okay. You know, if you're a bit rough, that's fine. As long as you're filled with the Holy Ghost and you can preach God's word with power. That's what we're looking for. That's what people want when they hear preaching. That's what's going to change people's lives. The soft stuff, the fancy stuff, the intellect, high, higher intellectual stuff doesn't change people's lives. Okay? It's not what people want. People want the hard preaching, even though the flesh does not want it. I know the flesh does not want it. The flesh wants the stuff that tickles your ears. But if you're saved, the new man, the spirit, wants to hear the word of God without compromise. All right? Luke 7, 27. Luke 7, 27. Speaking of John the Baptist, this is he of whom is, it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Okay, now Jesus Christ is quoting Malachi 3.1, which says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. The way before me. This is God speaking. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. So John the Baptist came preparing the way of God. Jesus Christ is God. We see as we go through this chapter how many times, you know, just those little, uh, what is it, the little hints are being dropped of who Jesus Christ is. And so this confirms Christ, but it also confirms John the Baptist. Jesus is saying, look, John the Baptist is the one that Malachi prophesied of. He's a fulfillment of Scripture as much as I am. Verse 28, Luke 7, 28. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women... There is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So I don't think this is hard to understand. Was John the Baptist a great prophet? Absolutely. Was he the greatest man that's ever lived? Absolutely. That's what Jesus Christ says. But you know what? 
it doesn't matter how much greatness you achieve in this life. Okay, I'm, t- I'm not talking about achievement in the Word. I'm talking about even achievement, achievement um, serving the Lord. Even achievement, uh, doing the things that God wants you on this earth. It doesn't matter how, much, how great you are of a man or a woman of God. You know what's greater than that? Just being the least in the kingdom of God. Just being saved. All right? If you're saved and you do nothing, what do you have? You're born again. You have the new man, right? And when you're in heaven, guess what? You're without sin. You're without the sin nature. And it's better to be that way than to be a man who has great success on the earth. Now, is this passage saying that John the Baptist would be least in the kingdom of heaven? No. It's saying his earthly ministry in comparison to just being in heaven, that's least. It's better to be, sorry, to be the least in heaven. It's greater to be that way, all right? And so, you know, our desire as we go in and see souls saved, these people may never come to church. Now, I hope they do. These people may never be baptized. These people may never even read the Bible again. They may never do anything that has eternal value. But if their souls are saved, you know, they're going to be greater in heaven than the greatness that you can achieve on this earth, okay? But that's not saying that John the Baptist would be, uh, you know, uh, less than those people. No, absolutely. Because John the Baptist had great works. He had a great mission and he fulfilled that in his life. And he lost his head preaching the word of God. Okay, John the Baptist in heaven will be a great man. No doubt about it, okay? But something that we can take from this, guys, as well, is that not everybody in heaven is equal, we don't, you know, heaven is not a socialist, communist place where God just takes all his riches and divides them equally. No, hey, when it comes to equality in heaven, we're equally saved because we all have the righteousness of Christ imputed upon us. We're all righteously deserving to be at home in heaven forever. But you know what? There is a rank in heaven depending on how much you've done for God. And if you've you lived your life serving the Lord, you're um, uh, laying up treasures in heaven and there are going to be authorities in heaven there'll be kings and, and people under them and so on and so forth you know the more you do for God in this life like a John the Baptist the greater you will be in heaven the greater rewards the greater responsibility the greatest uh, you know honor in Christ obviously that you'll have and so there's this this big misconception that everybody in heaven is just equal no it's not equal Okay, the more you do for the Lord today, the greater you'll be rewarded in heaven. So keep that in mind, especially the young guys, especially the children. You've got your whole life ahead of you to earn all the rewards you can. Or you can be the least in heaven and do nothing for the Lord. It's still good, but you can be doing so much more for Him. Okay? Uh, Luke 7, Luke 7, verse 29. And all the people that heard Him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. So we see certain people, the publicans, they were baptized in the baptism of John, which was to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, So there was a group of people like that, that justified God, meaning that what we heard was just, what we heard was right, what we heard was correct, and we believe on Christ. But then look at verse 30. But the Pharisees and lawyers, so the so-called spiritual leaders, the, the lawyers, those that knew the word of God, they rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. So they rejected John the baptized, Baptist. They did not get baptized. They did not believe on Christ. Verse 31. And the Lord said, Whereunto then shall I liken the men of this generation? And to what are they like? They are like unto children sitting in the marketplace and calling one to another and saying, We have piped unto you and ye have not danced. We have mourned to you and have and and ye have not wept. To be honest, I kind of struggled with this saying a little bit until I started to understand like the rest of the, the verse there. I might just read it very quickly. Verse 33 and 34. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and ye say, He hath a devil. The Son of Man is come eating and drinking, and ye say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. 
So I think if we understand verse 33 and 34, we can understand the, the verse 32. But what, what, what Jesus is saying is that John the Baptist, he was a wild man. He was, he was in the wilderness. You know, he, he, he uh, you know, wasn't, he wasn't festive. He wasn't, you know, feasting and celebrating. And the Pharisees and the lawyers would look at him and condemn him and say, well, this man is of the devil. This man has a devil. Look at him. Look, look at the way he lives. He's of the devil. But then verse 34, you have Jesus Christ who does, uh, you know, attend, uh, you know, feasts and, and is, uh, you know, um, he's not in the wilderness so much, but he's, he's amongst the people and he's eating and he's drinking. And the Pharisees look at him and say, well, look at this man. He's gluttonous and he's a wine bibber. He's a wino. He's a drunkard is what they're saying about him. And I think this is where the saying comes, you know, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. No matter what you do, you know, in the, in the, in the eyes of certain people, they're, not, they're never satisfied, you know. And I think that's where we get verse 32. I'll just read it again. And they, being the Pharisees, are like unto children sitting in the marketplace and calling one to another and saying, We have piped unto you and ye have not danced. And we have mourned to you and ye have not wept. So when we want you to dance, you're not dancing. And when we want you to mourn, you're not mourning. It's kind of like John the Baptist. We want you to eat, but you're not eating. You're in the wilderness. And to Jesus, we want you to, to stop celebrating, but you keep celebrating and being festive and and eating with people when you don't, you know. So it's kind of like the Pharisees are just being critical of both John the Baptist and Jesus Christ, no matter what they do. It's not so much that they're against these men. They're just against the Scriptures. They're just against God. And they want their way, and they don't want to uh, humble themselves and accept the people that God has uh, sent. Now, verse 34, I do want to address this very quickly. Because... I believe drinking alcohol is a sin. I believe the Bible teaches that quite clearly. All right? And I've heard people use this verse to say, well, hold on. Here we have evidence that Jesus Christ drank alcohol. Because in verse 34, it says the Son of Man, referring to Jesus, <coughs> is come uh, eating and drinking. All right? And you say, and ye say, so Jesus is saying, and you say, you Pharisees, you say, behold a gluttonous man, and a wine bibber. So a wine bibber is an alcoholic, a wino, a friend of publicans and sinners. All right. So here it is. Well, here it is. Like, look, they're saying, see, Jesus Christ is a wine bibber. He's drinking alcohol. Now they'll say, well, maybe he wasn't drunk, but you know, we can see clearly that, that he was drinking alcohol because they're, they're accusing him of being a wine bibber. I mean, this is how far people go to justify their drinking of alcohol. Is Jesus saying this is what he was doing? No. He's saying this is what the Pharisees are accusing Jesus of doing. In other words, it's a false accusation. All right? And look, look at it again. Verse 34. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Behold a gluttonous man. Do you think Jesus Christ was a gluttonous man? Of course not. Because Jesus Christ was without sin. And gluttony is a sin. Okay? Eating too much is a sin, and then, and our wine beer bar. Okay, so if Jesus was not a gluttonous man, do you think he was a wine beer bar? Do you think he was drinking alcohol? No, it's a false accusation. It's an ama it's amazing thing. It, it, it boggles my mind when people would take a false accusation of the Pharisees and say, well, this proves that Jesus was drinking alcohol. Then you're making the same accusation that the Pharisees are making of Jesus Christ. It's crazy. Anyway, that's not the point of this sermon. Let's move on. Verse 35. But wisdom is justified of all her children. And one of the Pharisees desired, desired him that he would eat with them, with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. So there, there we have Jesus Christ. Yeah, no worries. You invite me to come and eat with you. Jesus Christ was there eating, eating at the table. Even though this Pharisee, as we'll soon see later, was not someone that believed on Christ. Okay? Verse 37. So this Pharisee, his name is Simon. He was not a believer of Christ, but still he invited Jesus Christ to come and eat with him, okay? Verse 37, And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, uh, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. By the way, when the Bible says, which was a sinner, we, we're all sinners, you know, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the, when the Bible specifically wants you to know this person was a sinner, it means that person was exceedingly sinful. Okay, everybody knew this was a, a rotten person. Okay, 
And uh, so she brought an alabaster box of ointment, um, verse 38, and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. So this, this, this woman, a lot of people say she may have been a prostitute. I don't know. She may have been a harlot. The Bible doesn't actually tell us, okay? Uh, just so you know, maybe, maybe she could have been that way for people to have recognized her as a sinner. Uh, one thing, I just, just for your information, I want you to uh, realize this is not the first time. Well, sorry, this is the first time. But it's not the only time a woman comes to Jesus with an alabaster box and, and puts like perfume on him, okay? The other time, you don't need to turn there, is in Matthew 26, verse 6. So, whose house was Jesus in right now, in Luke 7? In a Pharisee's house. And by the way, this, this Pharisee, his name is Simon. You'll soon see why. You'll see Jesus calls him Simon later on. But in Matthew 26, this is later, this is toward the end of his ministry. In Luke 7, we're still near the beginning of his ministry. In Matthew 26, we're near the end of his ministry. Verse 6, it says, Now when Jesus was in Bethany... In the house of Simon, so yeah, Simon, Simon the Pharisee, no, Simon the leper, okay, this is a totally different Simon. There came unto him a woman having an alabaster box with very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. So the second time, the woman actually pours it on his head, whereas this time, as you saw, she puts it on his feet, okay? Does that make sense? He's both at, he's at Simon's house, but they're different Simons. So I just want you to be aware of that. Uh, I've seen people get that confused and they're using these same stories interchangeably, but they're not. They're totally different stories. Anyway, we see this woman, a great sinner, come in, washing the feet of Jesus Christ, kissing his feet, obviously showing great love and great service to Jesus Christ. Obviously, there's something about Jesus that she greatly appreciates. Verse 39. Now, when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it, he spake within himself, again, he's just, these are thoughts, saying, this man, if he were a prophet, now do you see the lack of faith there? This Pharisee was not a believer of Christ. He says, if he were a prophet, in other words, he's not a prophet, okay, he's not of God. If he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. Okay. Uh, verse 40, and Jesus answering said unto him, I love it because Jesus just reads his thoughts, you know, proving that he's God, reads his thoughts. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors, the one owed 500 pence and the other 50. Now let me just stop there for a minute. A pence is the value of a penny. Okay. So if you've got one pence, you've got one penny. Now, if you've got 500 pence, it doesn't mean you have 500 pennies, but that the money that you have in your pocket is valued at 500 pence. Does that make sense? All right? Um, and if you remember, we've covered this before, but a penny was roughly a day's wage back in those days. You, you, you worked a normal job, you know, a full day's job, you get paid a penny. So to understand this story, let's just convert that a little bit. Let's keep the math easy. Let's say the average worker gets 100 bucks a day. I know it's more than that, but let's just keep the math easy. Let's say you, you work a full, full-time job, you get 100 bucks a day, all right? So if you work out what 500 pence is, that would be 500 times $100 a day. That would be roughly $50,000. So there's one guy owing $50,000, a, a big amount, all right? And the other was 50, 50 pence. So 50 times 100, you get 5,000, right? $5,000. So just so you get the idea of the picture of the values, someone owns about, owes about $50,000. Someone owes about $5,000. Verse 42. And when they had nothing to pay, so neither of these guys that owe money can pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore, which of them will love him the most? I think we all know the answer to that, right? The one that owed the most. Verse 43. Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, thou hast rightly judged. You're right, Simon. The one that's going to appreciate the one that forgives would be the one that um, owes the most against him. And we see this woman, this great sinner, 
And now we understand a little bit of her mindset. Why is she spending this expen expensive ointment on the feet of Jesus? Why is she washing his feet with her hair? I mean, it's a disgusting thought, really. You know, people's feet, they're not the most nice things, you know, they're, they're dirty or whatever, and you're washing it with your hair. That's what this woman is doing. We can see she's had a lot forgiven of her. Okay, she's like this woman owing $50,000. Maybe next to Simon owing $5,000, okay? Regardless, though, they both owe and they can't pay. They're both sinners needing the salvation of the Lord. And verse 44, And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she have washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman have anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loveth much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, I love this, thy sins are forgiven. All right, this woman's sins are forgiven. Now I just want you to notice uh, a couple of things here. We're near the end. Are her sins forgiven because she wept and, and washed his feet with tears? Is that why her sins are forgiven? Is it because she came kissing his feet? Is that why she's forgiven? I just want you to think about it. I'm not telling you to answer that right now. Because there are some that will say, in order for you to be saved and have your sins forgiven, you have to serve the Lord. You have to do, uh, you have to love and serve Him in order to be saved. But is that, is that what got her forgiven? Well, let's read on. Let's read on. The answer is coming up. Verse 49. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that can forgive, that forgiveth sins also? Look at this, verse 50. And he said unto the woman, Thy faith have saved thee. Go in peace. Thy faith have saved thee. So let's get this right. The woman comes to Jesus Christ. What saved her? What had her sins forgiven? Was it the service to the Lord? The crying and the tears? Jesus says, no, it was your faith. You believing on me, you trusting me, you knowing that I would forgive your sins, that's what got you saved. All right? And then because she was like a, this person that owed like $50,000 in that sense, a great sinner who had her sins forgiven, she was someone that just could not help but serve the Lord. She could not help but kiss his feet and, and, and wash his feet with her hair because she had a lot forgiven for her. Right, so let's understand these two things, these two concepts. Over here, I'm unsaved. Let's pretend I'm unsaved here. This pulpit represents salvation, and this over here represents me as a saved individual. I'm saved now. So, in order to be saved, let's get this right. Thy faith have saved thee. I trust on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who I'm trusting in. That's what's going to get me saved. It's my faith on Christ. So I cross this barrier here. Okay, I'm now saved. I'm now saved. Now, I can be the least in the kingdom of God right here. I'll be like, you know what? I'm saved. I can live now however I want. I can do whatever I want. I don't need to go to church. I don't need to preach the gospel. I don't need to live in accordance to the commands of God. Yeah, you'll go to heaven. You'll be the least in heaven. Good. All right. But if you're the, like the woman who's had much forgiven, you're going to be driven to serve the Lord. You're going to be driven to, to love him and appreciate him and do great things. But whether you do the service of the Lord over here or whether you're just the least in the kingdom of heaven that does nothing, you're still saved, right? To cross the salvation barrier, you must have faith on Jesus Christ. Once you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are saved, right? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Okay? The gospel is salvation by grace through faith. Now, before we end, just the last three words there, guys, in verse 50, the last three words, go in peace. Go in peace. Jesus Christ, once he saves you, he wants you to be in peace. He wants you to relax. Take it easy. You're saved. You're saved. You don't need to doubt your salvation anymore. Once you've placed your faith on Christ, you can go in peace. All right? But I recognize a few things Probably in this woman anyway. And just like anybody else, 
that's committed sins in your life, and maybe you're still carrying the consequences of those sins. I'm not saying you're not forgiven. Okay, once you believe in Christ, all your sins are forgiven. Your past, present, and future sins are forgiven. But unfortunately, in this life, there are certain sins that you've committed, and you're still going to be carrying the weight of those sins. All right? It's just the way it is. It's life. Maybe the broken homes or the, or the fornication or, or, you know, abortions or just, just the wrong things that you did before. Okay? And you, even wrong things that you might do as a believer. You might still carry those sins with you. Okay? But you need to understand, just because you're still carrying the consequences of those sins does not mean you've not been forgiven. You have been. Jesus Christ wants you to go in peace. All right? And this is what I see is that, yes, even myself, okay? Even myself, we're still carrying the consequences of sins that we've done in the past, okay? Still the consequences. But you can be of one or two people. You either say, you know what? The Lord's forgiven me. I have to now forgive myself and move on and go in peace. That's what's going to get you serving the Lord when you can do that. Or you're going to just bog yourself down with the consequences and be like, oh, my life's ruined, this and that. No, that's not what Christ wants because that's not going to give you peace. God wants us, once we're saved, to rest in Him, have peace, put those things behind us. You've been saved, you've been forgiven. If you still commit sin, you have the Lord Jesus Christ you can go to, ask for forgiveness, and you can live in peace. That's what Christ wants from you guys. All right. So please stop carrying the baggage of your past sins. There are consequences. That's life. You're going to have to deal with it. But you have to just remember that Christ has paid for them. God has forgiven you. You need to forgive yourself in order to move on with your life. Okay? Let's pray.